Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure and privilege to introduce to you one of a living, a living legend, James Rosenquist. <laughs> James Rosenquist is an extraordinary person and he's an outstanding artist. We have today the opportunity to hear something about his life and about the new book, Painting Below Zero, that um, Jim wrote. I asked um, for a selected biography to, to introduce Jim, and um, I got this, and by the time I'll be through, um, I think our half hour is up, and you don't really want to hear me speaking, but Jim, so let me just say very, very briefly, um, you have 10 pages of solo exhibitions around the world, which um, included, I think, four retrospectives at the Guggenheim Museum and uh, two at the Whitney. James Rosenquist's work is in every major museum in the world, including the Metropolitan Museum, including the Museum of National Modern Gallery. Art and the National Gallery. The Smithsonian. <laughs> and uh, he, he had shows with um, many of the most important galleries as well, Sonab and Castelli, and today is represented by Aquavella galleries. Jim, you start your book um, and say painting has everything to do with memories, and uh, please share some of your memories with us. Hello, good evening, everybody. <laughs> good evening, good night. <laughs> well, time to go home now. Okay. Anyway. Four years ago, I think it's four years ago, I saw Sam at this very fair. And he says, what are you doing? And I said, I think I'm going to do a book. Because an old, 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 old friend of mine, who was sort of a fixture in New York, in the Castelli Gallery and other galleries, David Dalton, called me up and he said, Jim, why don't we do a book before you get Alzheimer's? And so I said, OK. So, so I saw Sam here at the art fair, and uh, he says, Jim, what are you doing? And I said, I think I'm, we're starting to do a book. And he says, oh, we should have a book signing at the Basel Miami Art Fair. And they, okay, here we, here we are. So uh, it's nice to see Sam again. And Sam has been kicked upstairs and now head of the Beiler Foundation in Basel. And uh, he's an amazing fellow because he takes care of everyone's wishes. I mean, he was, he's been amazing throughout these years. And be a busy, 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 busy guy. Uh, doing everything for everybody. And he's been very, very good. <clears throat> so I started writing this. I, so I sat down and started taping, 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 and taping my recollections. And all it is is my memory of many things that happened to me and m meeting many, many artists and people and their, what they were like and their personalities and so forth, which I knew, you know, quite well. And it's just contrary to some people who write a book about an artist who never met the artist. And they know the, all the dates and the time scheduled, but they never knew their personalities. So artists usually have amazing personalities, I think. I've known a great deal, a great number of them. So anyway, I'm going to show you some of my images on the screen, and I'll say a little bit about them. And then uh, Sam and I will maybe have a conversation or answer any questions in the, uh, in the audience. So gentlemen in the back, this is a painting I, this is a painting I did during the Eisenhower administration before JFK was, was elected. And the idea really was simple. I, well, I saw him on Broad Street sitting on the back of a car, convertible, in a baby blue suit, orange colored skin, because I think he had yellow jaundice, and this silver reddish hair. He looked handsome. He looked good. He looked like an advertisement. And because I had painted advertisements in Times Square for a number of years, I was always peculiar how people advertise themselves. So this is really like a campaign promise. You get a piece of cake and part of a Chevrolet if you're good. 
This is an early painting called Zone, one of my very first paintings, like a breakthrough picture. It's now in the Philadelphia Museum. This is called I Love You With My Ford, and it's just the idea of painting has had been taught for many years. There's books on looking at a painting and looking at the push and the pull and the composition and the movement in painting since Renaissance painting, but it, isn't really, it doesn't really work that way. Because if you're walking down the street and you see a pretty girl, you look, you see her face, her breasts, and her rear end, you go, wow. At the same time, you see a taxi cab driver eating a sandwich about to hit you with a taxi cab. So this add, these three flashes add up to danger. You're going to get killed. A piece of car fender, part of a sandwich, and a girl's legs. So that's really the way you identify death, is by quick flashes of identification just in spots. Like a very, anyway. So that's, this is three different parts, three different images. A car, two people whispering, and a field of spaghetti. How does it? This is called The Light That Won't Fail. Joe Hirshhorn bought it for uh, his museum in uh, Washington. It's about daily chores. This is called Air Hammer, two fragments of two cars colliding. And where the collision is, the windows are rolled down so there's no impact. It's just like a, a flow where there's no crash where the windows are rolled down. This is called In the Red. This is being shown in this at the fair right now. It was just sold here from Stefan Edlis sold it to, to somebody. It's an early painting, about 19... 62 or one or two or something like that. This is called Marilyn Monroe. And I saw Marilyn twice in my life. I never really met her. I saw her in Westchester County jumping out of a limousine to get a New York Times. She, she tipped all the Times papers on all over the sidewalk and jumped back in the car. And then I saw her with Arthur Miller in Times Square once. She was a beauty. Her hair was blowing around. And the day she died was the day I started doing the painting. It was like a quick, quick reference uh, to existential idea of someone coming and going quickly. This is called Silver Skies, 1962. It was in the, Bob Skull bought it way back. This is called Untitled. It's two canvases, a blue sky on top of a blue sky, like an empty mind, whatever. This is called Morning Sun. There's no black edge around the painting. That's just part of a photograph. This is called Be Beautiful. I think the Museum of Modern Art owns it now. It was, I gave it originally in California for Edmund Brown for, for governor. Then it was sold, and then the Museum of Modern Art picked it up later for a few dollars. It's all, I have a trick. My business ploy is sell things cheaply, and then they resold for millions later. <laughs> but, I, but I don't make a nickel on that. And I actually lobbied at the doorways of the Senate with Marion Javits and Bob Rauschenberg for a royalty bill. And our royalty bill passed the Senate, but failed the House. This is back in the early 70s, and uh, at the time we had very few friends in Washington. I could name him without taking off my shoes. We had Claiborne Pell, uh, Jake Javits, Koch, who was then a may uh, he before he was mayor, uh, John Bradamus, Livingston Biddle, and Sid Yates, and that was it. Not much help. They're very good guys. But our, the, the budget for all the arts in America was $155 million for everything. Visual arts, cinema, theater, theater arts, ballet, everything. And Ronnie Reagan came in and cut it to $97 million. And then it worked its way up again. I don't know what it is now, but it went 
to back to about 155 million again. So, the city of Berlin, Germany, allocates 900 million dollars just for the city of Berlin for the arts. This is called conveyor belt. There's a real conveyor belt at the bottom of the painting with a blip from the blips on a highway at the bottom of the painting. This is called Lanai after a trip to California in the 60s. And a Lanai is where young actors wait for the phone call from the, from the studios and they're living in a Lanai with a swimming pool and a, a very casual lifestyle. And in the book there's piece of there when I was hanging out with Dennis Hopper and we were going through at night going through people's houses with unlocked doors. Dennis says whatever you do don't say a word. <laughs> so we s s crept into this this um, house and there was John Barrymore the fourth reading and Dennis scored some grass, and we crept out of the, the house again over people's bodies, sleeping people. And that was before the Manson slaughter and before the Hillside Strangler. So it was very innocent then. Now, you go to L.A., you go, go see Mel Sikolsky in Beverly Hills, he comes to the door with a Glock pistol. So it's a different era. This is called Joan Crawford Says. This is again people advertising themselves. That was the idea. She uh, she was owned a big chunk of Pepsi Cola. And one time she was going to have a pop art show, and her pop art show was just bottle caps, big bottle caps of Pepsi Cola. So she sent candy grams to all the artists to come see the show. And when they got there, she shut the, she locked the doors and wouldn't let anyone in. <laughs> so she was a very unusual lady. I don't know what I'm clicking. This is called volunteer. It's just an idea of a person who volunteers. I knew a guy who was a volunteer in the Spanish Civil War, and when he volunteered, he didn't know what to do. This is a segment of a F-111 painting. That black image is a doorway into the Castelli Gallery. Here's another wall of the painting. Here's another wall of the painting, and there's the end wall, the last wall of the, the painting. Here it is installed at the Metropolitan Museum in the, six, in the late 60s or early 70s. This is called Flamingo Capsule, dedicated to three astronauts who got burnt up on the launch pad and never took off. This is um, a work called Horizon Home Sweet Home with a dry ice fog floor. And this photograph is from Claude Picasso, who was a very good photographer. And I met him with another photographer, Gianfranco Gorgoni, he's Italian. And um, he, Claude and Paloma were disowned by Pablo Picasso. And Gianfranco told me that he went, they went to see Pablo Picasso and he wouldn't let them in. He made them stay outside. Then Picasso died. And I would see Claude often in Paris at Fondation Picasso, right by the Ritz. So I said to him, you know, I was just in Spain. Well, I'll go on with another picture about this. This is called Snow Fence. Comes from a number of ideas. I was in jail protesting the war in Vietnam, and on the bottom of the floor, I saw all these little marks of people not marking off time. But also, it came from growing up in North Dakota in a blizzard, where if you're lost in a blizzard and you found a snow fence, it would lead you back to the barn. So it was identity. This is called Just Desserts. It's 24 feet long.
Just desert or just desserts? This is called Star Thief. There's a long story. It's 17 feet high and 46 feet long. And uh, a friend of mine who was here somewhere on the floor, Bob Adelman, he said, Jimmy, Life Magazine would like to do an article about me, I mean him, photographing you doing a painting, and then it's going to be televised by CBS. So he took a million photographs, Bob took a million photographs of me working on this thing. And uh, then Dade County wanted to buy it here for a holding area in Eastern Airlines. And Frank Borman said he'd been around the moon 10 times and space didn't look like this. And the painting is not about space anyway. It's about the metaphor of working, yeah, about it. Anyway, um, so then they called me and said, we have to make some new decisions and we can't, they're gonna buy it for two, 375 grand, something like that. Next day, Bert Kanner from Chicago called up and says, can I buy it? I says, first come, first serve, he bought it. He kept it for about 10 years and then he sold it to the Ludwig Museum, way over a million bucks. I don't know which way I'm clicking here. This is called skin stretched to non-objective ground. And all is an experiment of painting on formica, like this material on this table, where you can't see yourself in it. There's no grain, there's no warp and woof in it, there's no Nothing interesting about that surface, surface, so you can't project anything into that surface. This is called um, Through the Eye of the Needle to, to the Anvil, about how little ideas become big ideas. This is a, has a title like Salvador Dali, it's called The Masquerade of the Military Industrial Complex Looking Down on the Insect World. That came from watching ants and insects do their thing, and I was bigger than them, and I could oversee what they're doing. And when I was working in Times Square, down Broadway came a cop car, down 45th Street came an ambulance, they crashed. And I, I could see them coming, and I thought, gee whiz, if I could phone them, they wouldn't crash. I had the advantage. So there's a lot to this. This hangs in the Art Institute of Detroit. This clickered. This is called Time Dust Black Hole. It's about the uh, garbage dumps up in space where they park leftover stuff. And I thought that would make a great museum because you could take a square rigged sailing ship, any kind of a refrigerator, a car, anything, put it in space, it would never disintegrate and future people could go up and look at this museum because it would remain intact forever. This is called Military Intelligence. It's bought by a Microsoft guy, John Shirley. And it's sort of self evident the corner, the left corner of the stretcher bar is burned to char to, to dirt, I mean to charcoal, the, the wood is burnt up. It's like self-emoliation. This is one panel of uh, a 86 foot painting I did for the Guggenheim called Swimmer in the Econo Dash Mist. You see there's a fragment of a Guernica painting. Here's the next part of it. And that's the end of that. There was three paintings I did for Tom Krenz uh, some, some years back. There, there, there's the whole thing together, 86 feet long. This is called The Meteor Hits Picasso's Bed. 
and there's a 1937 Picasso cubistic nude lying on his burnt bed with cactus. So that other story I was telling you about, I said to Claude Picasso, I said, I just came back from Spain, I saw all this cactus, and I said, gee, it really looked like Picasso's bather sculptures. Claude says, on the contrary, Claude Picasso was influenced by the angular faces of the peasants. He said, well, excuse me. So after being disowned by, he was very protective of Pablo Picasso later on. This is called the um, stowaway peers out at the speed of light. It's from a series of paintings, speed of light paintings. This is 46 feet long and 17 feet high. There's another speed of light picture. Looks totally non-objective. There's another one which I like. It's about nine by nine feet square. And here's a painting, and, and the, there's a little slot in the up top of the painting which has a clock in it. Which in the arms of the clock there are laser beams. And so it's very peculiar. If you're standing next to it, the minute hand takes a minute to go around, very one minute. But with the laser beam, it shines a dot 100 feet, 200 feet, a mile, way out. It goes really quick. It shoots around. But it shoots around in only one minute. So it's very strange. So if you go backwards into the center of the clock, does time stop? So it's an experiment on uh, times time, space, and time, which I've been confused about now for a few years. Here's another time painting. The spot on the left is a mirror that's spinning. If you look in a mirror, you see yourself. If you look in a spinning mirror, you see yourself. You put anything on that mirror, the faster it spins, it'll almost disappear, totally disappear. This is called I think it's called as things emanate from a beginning, the definition changes. Here's another one with the spinning that's one of my secretaries, Charlotte, seeing herself, but you see the, the the clock numbers are about to go into a blur. So it's a painting and then another thing in the same painting. There's my studio in the 60s. See how messy I used to be. There I am looking at a reducing glass. That's it. Thank you very much. That's the end of that. You can turn that off. Turn it off. So be, before we go into um, questions, I would like to start asking you one. Jim, like, we were able to see some, some of your incredible paintings, but the one thing we could not see on the screen is how they're actually painted. And one of the things that fascinates me with, you, with your work is to what a perfection you're actually able to paint anything that you, you see, even the, as complicated things as reflections on any mm -hmm. material, etc. Can you tell us something about how you actually painting and also about how you, you got to um, earn those skins? Well, I could do a quick synopsis and then you wouldn't have to buy a book. And <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I was born out in North Dakota, I'll say it quickly, I was born in North Dakota my mother and father were avia early aviators, and they were adventurous. And I had an uncle, Albert, who I was named after, who was in the Army Air Corps. And they, my, my father and he were planning to start an international airline, selling their cars and buying a small plane. You know what that was, so simply, it was merely a mail route from Winnipeg to, to Grand Forks, North Dakota. That's how simply some of the big airlines started. Anyway, Albert crashed got killed, the depression crept out to the Midwest, and that was the end of that. So I was an only child. My folks were moved around a lot. I had to entertain myself. 
So I was always by myself drawing, entertaining myself on rolls of wallpaper. When my mother would give me rolls of, on the back of wallpaper. I'd, okay. So early on, my mother said, you're always drawing. Maybe you make some money on it. Because <laughs> we didn't have any money. So <laughs> I answered an ad in a paper, wanted artist sign painter from a guy, W.G. Fisher, who was an army vet who still wore his army clothes. And uh, I traveled to North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, painting Philip 66 emblems on gasoline tanks all over, in the, in the, in the, all over the countryside. Then I, I started the University of Minnesota. I met an incredible artist named Cameron Booth, who was in World War I, who st studied with Hans Hoffmann in Munich after the World War I. And I drew all the time in his class, and he says, Jim, there's nothing for you here. You should go to Newark, New York immediately and study with Hans Hoffman. Hans Hoffman I quit teaching. I got to know him later, but I never studied with him. So I got a scholarship, one year scholarship to the Art Students League. Um, studied there, hungry, was homeless. And I had the ups and downs in Manhattan, I'll tell you about it. And so my friend in the league says, Jim, I know of a great job where they have a lot of food. Some very wealthy people in Westchester called the Stearns. And this guy's father started Bear Stearns Stock Brokerage. You probably heard of that one. And it was Roland Stearns. Nice guy. He wasn't spoiled. He was, had been in the Navy, saw action in the South Pacific. And I think, he, God bless him, I think he's about 83 years old now, something like that. Anyway, I spent a year with them, very nice people. Then I th thought, this isn't my, I lived in a mansion in, uh, up on the Hudson River. Beautiful place, very fantastic. And people I met there, I met Superman before he shot himself, George Reeves. I met artists, art dealers, and so on. It, and I was a bartender, this was my job. Anyway, I left there. Well, before I left Minnesota, I, I got a job with General Outdoor Advertising, painting billboards, painting pictures. I could do, I did pretty well. They hired me, I worked, I saved 300 bucks, moved to New York. Anyway, after the Stearns, I went to the International Sign and Pictorial Painters Union Local 230 and uh, said, I want to transfer in. And they, it was largely Italians, tough guys. They said, why do you want to do that for? There ain't no jobs for you here, kid. What do you want to do this? I said, so I got up, I made a speech. I said, I respect the rights of all the older gentlemen in this union, and I'm willing to make my turn. The guy goes, ha, 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 ha. OK, bring your initiation fee around Thursday. So I did, and I got a job. My first job was painting a Hebrew national salami sign on a Flatbush extension in Brooklyn. <laughs> And then went to work at St top of Stouch's Baths in Coney Island, where big, fat women took off their, got naked up on the roof to get a suntan. And I was painting a um, Seagram's whiskey sign above them. And I said to my helper, Red Smith, I says, Red, we better announce we're here or we're going to get caught for being peepee toms. He says, that's a good idea. So I said, good morning, girls. They're all laying on their tummies, naked. One lady says, don't worry, Sadie. They don't look anyway. <laughs> then, then Red threw his cigarette down on a tarpaulin, and the damn thing started on fire, and all these naked ladies ran off the roof. It was like, it was a happening. It was, a, it was incredible. So I had numerous experiences. Uh, with labor, labor, labor relations. Because I was 23, all my helpers were 45, 55, 65, and 75 years old. And one fellow, Pete Murray, it's all, this is all in a book. I was introduced to him. I worked with all old men. And the boss, J Jake Beerman said, James, I'm sending you out with Pete. He took one look at me, he goes, I ain't going out with that son of a bitch. And I said, well, thank you very much. Nice to know you. 
So we went out, I got rid of him in a month because he had an open morphine prescription and he was a little kooky from the war, the World War I yet. Anyway, so um, uh, I had, uh, okay, I'll tell you one quick story too. I worked with 1930s New York communists, the old school communists in New York, Gus and Harry. I go to my first union meeting, Gus and Harry says, Gee, Jimmy, come on over here and have a beer with us. So I have a beer with them. I get up to go to the toilet. Out comes the head of the union, John Scotty. He's about this tall, tough as nails. Not the mafia, but they could deal with the mafia. So he looks at me and he says, James, see that side of the room over there? It's all red. You get a little red on you, it don't wipe off. So I says, John, those are my fellow workers. I told you. They only tell you once. I told you. Then, next, I'm working in Times Square, and I go over to Beefsteak Charlie's, which was a bar right next to the old bus depot on 50th Street, and I walk in, and the, I'm wearing winter clothes with a hood and dark glasses, and there's a Russian sitting at the bar drinking cheap whiskey. He turns around and he says, I want to meet the American worker. So we traded cigarettes, wristwatches, blah, 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 blah. And I said to him, don't go away. Stay right here. I went and got Gus and I says, hey, you guys, there's a real Russian. This is 1958 now. There's no Russians, new Russians in New York because of the, because of the uh, you know, the McCarthy era. So they came in and I said, uh, this is Gus and Harry. This is Mr. Gablurski or Neria for whatever his name was. He was an agent for the dancers. And, the, and so the Russian guy look, takes one look at him and goes like this. Wouldn't have anything to do with him. They were New York communists. He was a Russian communist or whatever he was. So it's, it was, to me, it was bizarre. Anyway, uh, in uh, 1959, two guys, I used to work way up in the air, 22 stories on a scaffold, painting, uh, painting every image, scaling it up by squaring off a sketch. Uh, and it was very, very loose, and I had to do a really good job. I mean, one instance, I was working on top of the Latin Quarter, and about five stories below, there's an ensign in his whites. He goes, yo, come down here, boom. So I came down, and he, he showed me this little photograph, black and white photograph from a photo mat. He said, look at this little girl. Isn't she beautiful? Uh, she won the Miss Wave contest in Staten Island, and I want you to put her face up there 20 feet instead of those other faces. So I said, well, what does she look like? Oh, she's a little Georgia peach with blue eyes and blonde hair. So I painted, from a black and white photograph, I painted this woman. I, I sure hope it looked like her. <laughs> anyway, it was very loose, and I painted a lot of uh, imagery, and I had to paint it really good or I'd get fired. So uh, Sam was asking me how I learned to paint. Well, I, l I learned a lot about from old, old painters. And in 59, two guys got killed, and I thought, this is dangerous. So I quit. And uh, I quit. I finally quit the beginning of 1960. My last painting was called On the Beach, about a nuclear war, that 1960 movie, with Gregory Peck, I think, was in it. Anyway, that was it. I got a studio down on Coenty Slip for 45 bucks a month. And I started to wonder what I was going to do. And so the title of the book is called Painting Below Zero. It's not about being cold. It's about getting deeper than French non-objective painting or non-objective art. In other words, how could I introduce imagery back into painting and still be almost a non-objective painter? That came from painting things so close 
that the image was really in sort of in back of one's head. It was painted correctly, but very, very huge. So I thought maybe I could make it a mysterious painting by setting these images in a certain time of recognition in a picture plane, and that's, that's what I tried to do. So I, so I in this studio, I uh, painted and painted. I had about five or six paintings. And Henry Geldseller, Dick Bellamy, and Ivan Karp came by. I didn't know them. I knew Dick from being a hangers-on at the Cedar Tavern. And they, they, Dick says, I'd like you to have a show. And I said, really? And I tell you, the, the, the reason is I was trying to develop something. I didn't want to sell my work either because I didn't know what I was exactly doing. So by February 62, I had my one, first one-man show with Dick Bellamy on 57th Street, sold it out. 63, all my work went to the 16 American show with Dorothy Miller. The following year, the last show I did with Dick Bellamy, and then that 64, I joined uh, Leo Costelli. said, Jim, if you ever think of leaving Dick, please consider me first. So I did that, and by 65, I made the front page of the New York Times with that F-111 painting. So that's it. <laughs> it's, that's it's not it, but it's only a peak of the iceberg. Thank you, Jim. Thank yeah, you so much. Books. This is not even the peak of the iceberg. If you read that, uh, this book, it is so full of incredible, incredible stories. Not only sto uh, stories about Jim and his life, which, which really is telling also the, the story of, of the 20th century in, in America. It also tells you a lot of stories about other artists. Jim was um, very close with, uh, with Bob Rauschenberg yeah, and Bill other Kooning. important artists. He met uh, even uh, George Gross and many of the people we only know, know, know out of the history books. Well, here, are, here is a book which is history, about a man who is history, but very, very much alive, as you have seen. And if you have some energy left, please um, come here and um, uh, get a book, buy a book, and uh, I think Jim is, uh, will also sign it for you. Yeah. Jim, if for the visitors who are here, um, where can they see work on the fair in, on which booth? Well, I got a couple of paintings at the Aquavella Gallery, for sure, and then I don't know where else, maybe, maybe not. Good. Okay, so please go out and uh, um, check um, his work and have a look at the book, which I can testify is wonderful. Big applause to Jim Rosen. You could, you could ask for questions. Oh, there's one question. Okay. Are you going to take a question? Great. No. It's not even just a question, uh, Jim. Uh, when you sold the, the uh, art piece to Miami-Dade County and then Borman kaputted uh, that piece and you ended up selling it somewhere else, that was from Art in the Public Places here in Dade County. I want you to know that I became a trustee of Art in the Public Places about 10 years later. I wasn't part of that then. But 10 years later, and I want you to know what they did because of what happened in your situation. I don't know. Well, I'm going to tell you. They will never allow that to happen again. There's no politics ever again in any purchases by uh, art in the public places. And it was all because of what happened in your situation. <laughs> and the, and really? I just want you to know, never again here. And, and it's because of, of what happened well, to you. That's good for future artists. I'm sure many people would love to ask questions, but there's even more people who would like yeah. to have um, um, your book signed. So. I think maybe um, um, if you would come over, uh, or you want to sign them here, or maybe if you would come there, and maybe you'll ask you. Make Bob Adelman move. <laughs> um, and maybe you can ask the, your, your questions personally. Yeah. Okay.